housing and criminal history. So 97% of people currently uh, in prison are going to be released back into the community. Most of them into the community in which they're incarcerated. So in Idaho, we've got a fair number of state prisons just outside of Boise. Uh, there's a women's prison in Pocatello. There's a couple of state prisons up in North Idaho. There are no federal prisons in Idaho. So uh, federal people who go to Idaho, who are from Idaho, go to federal prisons and go out of the state. But most of those folks come back to Idaho as well. And they're going to need, among other things, a place to live. So finding appropriate housing is one of the real struggles that offenders have when they get out of prison. And uh, many of you could anticipate what those hurdles are. Uh, but, but we want to approach this uh, largely not only as a housing problem, but as a public safety problem. Because you still can't hear? I'm not eating the mic. All right, so um, I uh, brushed my teeth after lunch, because you get this next. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we know that the people uh, who are offenders are going to come back in to our uh, communities, and we want them not to reoffend. So housing is a key component of public safety and reducing recidivism. All right, hi, my name is Kathy Grismar. I'm the Public Policy Strategist for the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU of Idaho. Um, just to give you some context, kind of the perspective in which I'll be speaking about this work. We're not a housing authority. We don't house individuals, but we do do a lot of work with criminal justice reform and studying sort of the impact of our addiction to mass incarceration, what happens when people either enter the criminal justice system, and really importantly, when they leave the criminal justice system and they face um, numerous amounts of hurdles reintegrating back into society and being successful and so when people are leaving either prison or jail they're coming out and they're having to think of a lot of different things they need to meet some needs so employment you're gonna have to pay back legal fees restitution provide for yourself secure housing housing is a big issue which we're going to talk about today and then just general other barriers whether it be voting or accessing um, public benefits things of that nature um, but oftentimes what we're seeing is housing is really sort of in short supply here in Idaho. Um, our offices are in Boise, so we're really familiar with what's happening in the Boise area, especially with um, homelessness issues here in the city. Um, and they're really concerning to us because we want people who are coming out of prison or jail to be successful, to reintegrate into society. And in order to do that and to help lower rates of recidivism, people need to find housing and they need to find employment. And if one of those two basic necessities is missing, there are a lot of problems that these individuals are going to face. So we'll talk more about what's going on in Idaho here in just a little bit, but I'll give it back to Wendy. Thanks, Kathy. So I want to just talk a minute about what we call the growing reentry movement. One of the things that uh, Attorney General Holder uh, has emphasized in his tenure at the head of the Justice Department is that putting people in prisons is really not the only thing we do to make our communities safe. We have to make sure that those who are re-entering from prison are able to do so successfully. We have to do what we can uh, to prevent crime in the first place. So a big part of what my office does now is to work in re-entry and prevention. On the re-entry side, we participate with the federal court, the federal defender's office, and federal probation and a re-entry court that is an intense supervision for offenders. And uh, as part of that, uh, provides links to jobs, housing, things like that. We also uh, I go out and meet uh, periodically along with my first assistant with uh, people recently re uh, released from this in the state system to talk to them about uh, the pitfalls of reoffending and to, to uh, talk to them about what their resources are for getting housing and jobs. So um, there's just this great, uh, great consensus building among people who do what I do in law enforcement and the criminal justice system that simply putting people in prison is inadequate. And we have to do more at the re-entry uh, re end of things. And I think, again, you know, the statistics are really staggering. We are talking about a large segment of people in our communities. So these are some national figures. 
7.3 million adults currently under criminal justice supervision in the United States. That's people not currently in prison, but are under supervision uh, by the criminal justice system outside of a prison or jail setting. It's, you know, earlier today, one of my themes was it's expensive. It's expensive. Uh, $60 million spent annually to supervise those individuals. And that doesn't include things like the cost of prosecution, uh, restitution to victims, those sorts of things. And as you can see, it's a dramatic increase. In 35 years, we went from spending $9 billion on uh, the cost of supervision to $60 billion. I mean, $9 billion is $60 billion. So it's been a long time uh, since I was in school, and uh, my math is not great, but I think that's at least six, almost seven times uh, what we were spending in 1980. And that means one in every 31 adults is, uh, um, is under um, some supervision in the criminal justice system. That's also up a significant amount from 1980. So that's the on-release population, 2.3 million adults in prison or jail. A substantial increase again in the last 35 years. 1.5 million are in prison, so those higher security facilities, a smaller number in jail. Uh, so when we look at the 4.2 million adults are on probation and 828,000 adults are on parole, those figures based on that, I looked at these, don't include, uh, those are state system individuals, don't, don't include people in the federal system who are on what we call supervised release, which is a form of probation after your federal sentence has been served. All right, criminal justice history. I think that's you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit about kind of setting the scenario for what's happening. I mean, Wendy talked a little bit about what's going on nationally, and I'm going to kind of paint a picture for what's happening here in Idaho, because just as bad as the national numbers are, Idaho is pretty much um, one of the worst states in terms of incarceration. And so um, as these numbers up here show, we're incarcerating a lot of people. I think right now um, the U.S., the prison population in the U.S. accounts for 25% of the world's total population of incarcerated people, yet we only make up 5% of the world's population. And so we're really addicted to putting people in prison and jail. Um, and we're, we're really trying to combat mass incarceration right now at the national level. We have things like the failed war on drugs from the 1980s that have increased things like mandatory minimums, um, sentencing enhancements that are sending people to prison and jail for much longer than they need to be and not focusing on ways that we can really kind of treat the underlying causes of criminal behavior whether it be needing uh, accessing housing, um, education, vocational training, substance abuse treatment, mental health care, things of that nature and so we're seeing people who are going to prison probably shouldn't be there in the first place um, and now we're kind of dealing with this ballooning criminal justice complex that we have and how do we treat people who are exiting, reducing those numbers and saving less money. And if anybody has questions um, during the presentation, I'm a big proponent of asking questions. We really like freedom of speech. So yeah, in the back. Yes, go ahead. So if I understand your question correctly, why are a majority of Idaho's in population not actually Idahoans? Oh, got it. Got it. I understand your question now. Sure. Well, I'm going to go into that a little bit here because I have some statistics and some graphs that I'm going to show you about um, why Idaho is not one of the best states when it comes to incarceration. So right now um, in the country, we incarcerate at the 11th highest incarceration rate in the country, although we have one of the lowest crime rates in the nation. Um, so we're up there with states like Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, Alabama. One, they have much higher populations. Two, their crime rates are much higher than Idaho, and yet somehow we find ourselves um, 11th in the nation in terms of incarceration. So what leads to such a high incarceration rate 
are the reasons why we're sending people to prison. So um, our criminal statutes here that sentence people to prison, we're sending people to prison for low-level drug offenses, all the way up to things like murder, rape, burglary, things of that nature. But we're incarcerating people longer than they need to be. So right now, um, when you are sentenced to a prison term, when you have a felony conviction, you have a fixed sentence and you have an indeterminate sentence. Your fixed sentence will be you have to serve three years in prison. Your indeterminate can be anywhere from five to eight years. Um, and during that time of your indeterminate sentence, you could be listed as parole eligible if you meet certain requirements, go before the parole board and are granted parole where then you move out into the community and you're under supervision. Well, we're keeping people twice as long as that national average. So we have people who are very much ready to be released and return to the community to find housing, be reunited with their families, get back to work, and yet we're keeping them locked up. It's expensive for taxpayers because we are all paying for this system to continue working and it's really damaging to our communities to have people continue to be separated. But it's also building to this problem we have in terms of affordable housing and reducing recidivism when people are released because there are so many of these people coming out and um, oftentimes discrimination happens when people have a criminal history. I hope that helps answer your question a little bit about why Idaho is not so great. <laughs> And then if you look at probation and parole, we're up at the top again. So in terms of Idaho, for a population of probationers in the US, we're the fourth highest. And then again, in terms of parolees, we're 12th highest. So not only are we incarcerating a lot of people, we have a lot. These people are coming out of prison and jail um, and are on supervision with a criminal history. And so we have a lot of people who have come into contact with the criminal justice system who now, in some ways, have a target on their back when they're released. Um, which makes it difficult for them to find employment. There's no um, anti-discrimination laws in place that help protect people from being discriminated against when they're finding employment if they have a criminal background. Um, it's difficult to find housing. Um, you have things like sex offender registries. You have, this year, the legislature tried to pass a violent offender registry, which, again, will make it much harder for these people to reintegrate successfully. And so there's just not a good climate here in Idaho for people who are coming out of the prison system with a criminal background. But do not fret. There is a changing mentality coming across at the State House right now, which is exciting for us. Um, how many of you here, just a show of hands, heard about justice reinvestment from the 2014 legislative session? And raise them up high. OK, so not very many people. Well, good news. After this presentation, you can all raise your hands the next time someone asks this question. So what happened at the 2014 session was um, there was an organization that's a national organization called the Council of State Governments. They are working nationally to help states look at why are they incarcerating so many people and how can we reduce the number of people we're sending to prison and also how can we make parole programs much more efficient, which was what their focus was here in Idaho. So for short, it's called JRI. That's what I'll use from now on because Justice Reinvestment Initiative is kind of long. Um, but basically what the legislature did was look at a couple of issues that are affecting Idaho prison systems right now and how could they cut costs, so reduce taxpayer costs, and hopefully potentially put off building a new prison, which I don't think anybody wants. Um, and they looked at three things. So they looked at why, does, why is Idaho's recidivism rate so high? So there's a really high likelihood of people being released, whether they top out, which means they've completed their full sentence, or they're being released on probation and parole, and then they have a probation or parole violation or reoffend, and then get put placed back into the system. So why is that happening so much? They looked at prioritizing certain individuals to be eligible for parole. So you're looking at low risk, nonviolent, low level drug offenders. Those people are being prioritized to be released and pushed out onto parole because they really will be much more successful out in the community under supervision rather than being incarcerated. And then also looking at improving our data collection. So right now, um, the parole board and the Department of Corrections doesn't have really good data tracking that allows them to understand what are the actual causes of why people are reoffending, what are the demographics like, what are the circumstances behind people coming back into the system or their release um, into the community. So they're looking at improving that so they can track and identify what's working, what's not working, and where can they make um, improvements in the future. That was a lot of information. Does that make sense? Are there any questions on that? 
Yes. Sure. Not specifically, but I think just inherently it's a, oh, thank you, I forgot. The question was, are they looking at if someone was under the influence of drugs when someone re-offends re and ends up back into prison or in the beginning? And that's not in a big focus of this project, but I think inherently, and Wendy can hopefully back me up because I'm not an attorney, so I'm not in, as involved with the prosecution side, but that's generally something they would look at when they're investigating the crime or looking at sending, um, having a parole revocation hearing or something of that nature to send that person back to prison. So it's not a focus of this, but it is something I think that they're doing just inherently within the system. Am I correct in saying that? Particularly in the, uh, within the Federal Bureau of Prisons, I mean the focus on, on things like that is, is for treatment while they're in the prison setting. So in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which I, which I know about, I don't really know as much about the state system, they do look to see what were the circumstances and will the person while they're in benefit from a drug treatment program. In the state system, they don't? Yeah, but no. Okay. Right. Probably because that wasn't part of the official criminal conduct. And there's probably some interest in, in and maybe privacy reasons for that. But if the person, typically, anytime someone goes into the criminal justice system, whether the state or federal level, if there is a substance abuse issue, and that's often in the pre-sentence investigation report, then they'll try to deal with it with treatment in the, in the system. So what's happening in Idaho, too, is the... Um, as a part of this justice reinvestment piece with the Council of State Governments, they did a really thorough sort of investigation report about what's happening in Idaho. And they're looking at, um, for 2013, you had a 35% recidivism rate for people involved with our correctional system. Um, and 30% of those people who are on some sort of supervision who are violating the terms of their release ending back up into the prison system. And so not only are we having problems with people just being committed into the criminal justice system to begin with, but we're also having problems with people re-entering after they've been released. Um, and as Wendy was saying, it's happening, you know, on a national level as well. So Idaho is not unique in that um, circumstance, but it's certainly um, a really big concern for organizations like the ACLU who are working on criminal justice reform, but also for housing in terms of people who, the number of people we're seeing come back into, into the community needing affordable housing or access to secure housing, um, and people who have a, a criminal, um, criminal record, excuse me. And so in 2013, nationally, 700,000 individuals were released from prison and returned to their communities, um, which is a really large increase from what it was um, several decades ago. And as I was saying, it puts a really um, great strain on the communities in general. Again, you're seeing that um, revocations are one of the fastest growing admissions into the prison system. So again, kind of tying it back into what's happening in Idaho, realizing that Idaho has a really high rate of recidivism. So people are coming out, being released, and for whatever reason, um, not being successful as they reintegrate into society. And one of the things I spent a lot of time talking with legislators about why criminal justice reform is so important one of the biggest things I talk to them about is we need to give individuals the tools to be successful once they're released. Um, prison is not always the best way to learn coping skills, although I will give the Department of Corrections um, um, credit for doing their best. But really, these people are looking at things like they need access to education, they need access to substance abuse treatment, they need access to mental health care. These are some of the reasons why they're being entered into the criminal justice system to begin with. And making sure that people have access to affordable and secure housing is really one of the best ways to make sure that these people can be successful when they come back into society. Um, so why is there so much failure? So as we were talking about things like substance abuse, lack of education or job skills, um, poor reasoning skills, just a mentality that's not quite conducive to being successful once you reintegrate, um, needing support groups so you can be with individuals much like yourself to mutually support one another, 
mental health, which is a really, really big issue that we're seeing here in Idaho. Um, and again, absence of a stable residence to make sure that your basic needs are being met. So in terms of um, housing here, um, we're seeing that a lot of people who are coming out, um, excuse me, I just lost my train of thought for a moment. <laughs> we're seeing that a lot of people who are coming out from the criminal justice system and trying to look for housing oftentimes end up homeless because there's really a lack of affordable housing here. And that also has been um, a really interesting intersection for our organization to at least become more involved within the housing community. And we're a part of the Boise Ada County Homeless Coalition, but also intersecting with our criminal justice work. And so you'll see that oftentimes a lot of people who are being released from the criminal justice system do not have housing that they can access, whether that be um, living with a family member or relative, or they don't, they didn't save up enough money while they were working in prison so that they could afford something, or they just don't have employment. And so oftentimes they're ending up on the street I think here locally in Boise, I think if anybody drives past the 16th Street Bridge, not that all of those individuals down there have home or excuse me criminal backgrounds, um, but a really high percentage of those individuals do, and that's true uh, really across the country, um, where the criminal justice system and housing intersects into the homelessness issues here. Um, and for us, it's very, very important to understand that, again, I can't say this enough, that there are options that are affordable, that they're safe, that are secure for these individuals to be successful. They really kind of go hand in hand in terms of setting people up for success. So as the slide says, stable housing has always been a critical concern for people returning to society from the criminal justice system. Um, not having secure housing increases that rate of potential recidivism and reoffending, um, whether you have a parole violation or you're recommitting a new offense. And um, people who actually who end up in some of the homeless service organizations are often have a higher rate or chance of reoffending. And so, getting people into housing that where they can unite with their families, maybe reunite with their spouse, with their children, be able to create a stable living environment with their families go to work, come home after a hard day's work, put time and energy into, into creating their home, they're going to be much more successful than if they're scrambling, trying to find something that's more secure um, and affordable for them. And in terms of community costs, so one of the biggest things that the ACLU is seeing is that because this lack of affordable housing and because we have so many people actually in the criminal justice system, cities are really grappling with how to handle this large influx of potentially homeless individuals who are looking for housing. Um, I can only give you an example for Boise because that's where we've been involved with some litigation, but the city of Boise passed um, a homeless ordinance that criminalizes individuals for being homeless, um, preventing them from going out and panhandling and asking for, for money, which uh, for us is a violation of your uh, freedom of speech. Not to mention it's just cruel and inhumane to criminalize people who are homeless. Um, and so what we're seeing is cities and communities are looking at how do you handle the large influx of individuals who are homeless, who may not be able to access housing because of their criminal backgrounds. Uh, oftentimes they're turning to these ordinances where they're criminalizing people, so they're putting people back in prison for being poor, um, which is really sort of despicable in our opinion. Um, but what you're also seeing is that it's expensive for people to be housed in the criminal justice system. So just some numbers here. In 2014, um, the legislature appropriated $181 million for the Department of Corrections for their prison facilities here in the state. Um, and $20 million went to people who are on supervision. That's really incredibly expensive. And right now, as taxpayers are paying roughly $55 a day to house an individual in prison. And so it's expensive. It adds up. And when we're one of the highest rates of incarceration in the state, us as taxpayers are paying a lot of money. What, what happens to be a much cheaper solution and is more humane and affordable for all those involved is housing, um, and affordable housing at that. And so we want to see some of those options come forward. Um, so here you have a list of sort of a, approved options for people to come into housing. Another really great alternative that we've been watching and working closely 
sort of monitoring with some of our coalition partners are Housing First initiatives. How many of you have heard about Housing First initiatives? A few. Okay. Um, so in Utah, for example, this is the best example I have. There was a gentleman named Lloyd Pendleton who came in and realized that housing individuals was a much more appropriate solution than criminalizing homeless people, um, which I think we can all, all agree on. And it turns out that they built um, sort of a section of affordable housing and just placed individuals in housing first without any sort of requirements about um, you have to have a job, you have to go to AA, you have to do X, Y, Z in order to get this. They just put them in housing, met one of their first basic needs, and people were much more successful in moving along the socioeconomic trail, staying out of the criminal justice system, and it was a much cheaper solution for the city. Uh, it would be much cheaper for the city of Boise to do housing first than to pay attorney's fees to our organization when they lose these lawsuits we're filing against them for criminalizing homeless people. And so... I think as an organization, as a community, we have to think about what are some appropriate solutions for dealing with the large influx of people coming out of the criminal justice system, recognizing what we can do as a community to help make sure that they're successful and meeting people's needs both in terms of housing providers as well as so seeking housing. Any questions? Am I blowing through this too quickly? Yeah, in the, in the back. So I think your question was, if it is difficult to find housing, what happens to these individuals when they're released from the criminal justice system? Sure. So when they're being released and they're being placed, whether they're on probation or parole or just topping out, finishing your sentence, um, you have to have a plan in place. Essentially, that has been approved through the Department of Corrections, at least per my understanding. Um, and that includes where will you be living? Um, so it requires these individuals to communicate outside within their own networks to find housing that they might might be suitable for them. So I know if you're going to be placed on parole and maybe you went to prison for a drug issue. You can't live with anybody who has a background with drug with drug abuse. Um, you live with a friend who could help support you or or a family member. Um, you could live in a halfway house. So some of these transitional housing options. If you have nobody, then you get out with whatever you have in your you know personal account and you go and find find your way um, and oftentimes people spend through their money when they get out things are probably way more expensive now than when they went to prison in the first place and oftentimes you see them at some of the homeless shelters like Corpus Christi or Interfaith or City Life and so on and so forth so they really do prioritize some of these options here but sometimes those options just don't work for people and then they end up on the streets which is really unfortunate and then kind of kicks off that cycle again of entering in the criminal justice system. So opportunities for affordable housing are always welcome and encouraged. Um, we're not a housing provider, so I can't speak about what it's like to offer affordable housing, but I can say that it really does change lives for people when they come out of the system and are looking to bettering themselves and, and continuing moving on with their family and friends. Yeah. Our recommendation, well, uh, our organization supports Housing First initiatives. Um, again, we're not a housing organization, so I can't say that we're going to start operating an apartment complex run by the ACLU or anything. Um, but we do work within the Boise Ada County Homeless Coalition, um, working with our coalition partners there who do do a lot of the, the housing um, service and, and providing housing for people and are very encouraging um, of people having access to affordable housing, really kind of our... Um, where we can be supportive to the coalition is reminding cities and, and policymakers that criminalizing people because they're poor is not an appropriate solution. That there are other ways to use city dollars to help offer affordable housing for people. Putting them in prison or jail just because they can't afford housing is not an okay solution and generally unconstitutional, as was deemed by the courts against our lawsuit with the city of Boise. So. Um, we're here just to remind people why ho affordable housing is so important and, and how does it fit into this scheme of the criminal justice system, how we have this addiction to mass incarceration and what happens. I think oftentimes people think about, well, they did something wrong, they got to go to prison. We don't think about what happens when they get back out into the community because they have to come out at some point unless they're on death row or they're serving a life sentence. Uh, but a majority of people are coming back out. We have to do something to help them be successful. Yeah.
yeah, so her, her comment, her, her comment was, when you send people to prison or jail, that's how they're paying their debt to society, and when they come out, all should be good and clear to go, uh, which I very much agree with, uh, but doesn't always end up happening with some of these laws we have in place that prevent people from really being successful in transitioning, so. Sure. Mm -hmm. Which is very difficult, yes. Yeah, I think I saw a question in the back there, yeah, in the green. Sure, so the question was, if there were, and correct me if I'm wrong, if there are more vouchers, if we could hand those out to more people, helping more people access housing. Um, I can't necessarily say for sure what, what is good, because I'm, I'm personally not familiar with the voucher system or with any sort of the HUD um, designations for affordable housing, so I would have to defer to maybe Zoe or someone else who's really much more intimately um, aware of those programs. Um, I just, I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> sure, sure. Maybe that's something we could, we could table and Zoe could answer during a break or something. I'm just um, offering Zoe up <laughs> for questions. I think we need to, to come up with some creative solutions. If it's really hard to build affordable housing, if we don't have the, the land use policies and practices in place, um, then we need to also think of some, some creative things like um, increasing occupancy policies, making sure that not just two per bedroom, but maybe looking at whether we can expand those based on square footage. We also need to look at, do, are we going to encourage, maybe the Department of Corrections could create a voucher, help with a voucher program, or your communities could help pull money together to create additional. That's a way where we don't have to build housing. We can use additional, we can use the existing vouchers or create these new ones to actually um, help persons find housing in our community. Because it's a tight market right now. We're seeing a lot of housing providers who are not actually taking Section 8 or VASH vouchers. Those are veterans vouchers. It's a serious, serious problem. And so it's a discussion that we need to have because we are having a growing number of people because of the tight market. The, 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 the low vacancy rates having a hard time finding housing. So we need to come up with some creative solutions. And, and I'm hearing that the city is working on it. I hope the city, the state, the county will work together with us to create those, those housing opportunities. One of the great things that I just want to share real quickly is that the lot of, there are a lot of supportive housing vouchers that are available to persons in our communities with persons with disabilities. And also, I've, connect, I've contacted the city of Boise, and they've been really good about when someone can't get into the shelter because of a disability, and maybe they had committed you know, a, uh, a crime and they can't access housing, and they're left on the street. I've asked for a reasonable accommodation to access a hotel voucher. So there are some creative solutions. Think about where, when we talk about reasonable accommodations later, there might be a possibility to ask for something that you've never thought of before in working with your community partners. Okay, thanks. Thanks, so. Zoe. And I'm going to take one last question because I'm sure Wendy has a lot to, uh, to share also. For the people on the web? <laughs> so the question was, uh, what? there was a reference to the fact that there are some apartment complexes that um, uh, prohibit all, all felons, that have a, a blanket rule. And that's really what I want to turn to next, using the microphone. Um, so, I mean, there are, uh, there are some concerns that housing providers might have, right, about uh, renting to uh, convicted felons. 
Uh, I mean, for a lot of people, it's a little bit of an unknown world. So uh, there may be these concerns, higher turnover. Uh, there may be that little assumption in place that, hey, they're criminals, they're going to commit crimes again, they're not staying here very long, they're unstable. Uh, we want stable uh, uh, renters who can pay, right? Isn't that the basic? And, and, and you want your apartment uh, complexes or your uh, duplexes or uh, the houses that you're renting to be safe as well, and the, the neighbors and the tenants to feel safe. Um, so you're concerned, maybe may concerned about lease violations, again, presumptions. If they've been in jail before, uh, they're going to do bad stuff. They're going to violate uh, their lease. Uh, community reputation. Uh, you don't want to be the housing provider that rents to the bad guys. Uh, uh, damage collections, that can be tough. How, how many uh, housing providers here have occasionally had to go to small claims court to try to get, yeah. How much fun is small claims court, right? Yeah. All right. Um, risk of injury, that's, that may be to rest and to your staff, the people who work for you. And then uh, because we know there are a lot of lawyers on for the afternoon, we have to use the lawyer word here, landlord liability for known preventable action. Uh, there may be the concern that if you rent to somebody with a, a felony record and you know about it, that you may be more liable. Well, let's, let's talk about some of these things. Uh, how, how many people think these are, are, should be prohibitions? Uh, flat out, you know, these are concerns. This is why we don't rent to felons. Right? No one's raising their hand. That was kind of an unfair, unfair question. <laughs> all right? So you can't really screen and deny for all criminal history because somewhere in there you're going to get a Fair Housing Act violation. I think as Mr. Block referred to earlier, you know, one, one of the things that can be sort of a, a cycle and we can have unintended consequences, um, nationally at least, the statistics are a little bit different in Idaho just because uh, Idaho does not have large uh, numbers of uh, minority populations. We're, we're, not, uh, we're not the most diverse state in the, in the union. Um, but historically, uh, the criminal justice system, and particularly in urban areas, has incarcerated disproportionate numbers of African-American men and other groups of racial minorities, that's just a fact. They're, go, they're in prison much more uh, so than their uh, non-minority uh, counterparts. Uh, a little less so in Idaho, just again because of the, the demographics. But if you have that kind of uh, entry into the, to the prison system on the, the front end, and I'm just not to suggest that people of color commit more crimes, it's a, it's a problem with the criminal justice system, um, that you may, those people when they come out, uh, who are protected by the Fair Housing Act, that uh, we don't want criminal history to be a proxy for discrimination on some other, other basis. So uh, we have to be careful about that. And then really there are, there are crimes that should, you would worry about, if someone living next to you, and then some not so much, right? Like, you know, the, the, the murderer, um, Reese, the murderer that, that occurred only a few years ago, and they maybe got a short prison sentence and released. Uh, that's one we might worry about. If it was a particularly violent murder, how about if it was a stranger murder of someone next door? So, so that's something to be concerned about. You know, trespassing, you know. How about, uh, you know, there may be other, other crimes that are, are not, you know, quite, quite so bad. Um, you know, possession of drugs. I was going to go with health care fraud because that's what I used to prosecute a lot of. But, um, you know, that's not so, there may be some kinds of, of fraud by deception, depending on what the person was getting. So there, there are some crimes that, that uh, are really would pose a risk to the values that, that you want to have for your community that are legitimate values, your business values, the safety of your um, tenants and the people who work there and your neighbors. So, so really, you know, give a, I want to encourage those of you who are housing providers to, to not have one of those blanket rules that prohibits all felons, but to look closely at what your criteria are and what you're trying to achieve with your screening criteria. And with, um, with criminal convictions, I mean, how old is it? And what has the person done since that time? Now, this is not going to be a housing-related story. I mean, trial lawyers, we tell trial stories. When I was a very new lawyer from the um, uh, Civil Rights Division, I was doing a case in Kansas City, and it was a, it was a racially motivated assault case. And one of my witnesses was this guy who was working for the same union as the um, uh, victim and the defendant. And one of the things we have to do when we're getting ready to go to trial is to look up their criminal history and see, because there, there are rules of evidence about what's of an impeachable conviction and what isn't. And so, I mean, this guy, he was like a great witness. Stellar guy had been with the, the union he was working for for a long time. Very good reputation as an iron worker. You know, great guy. Everything about him seemed fantastic. And we got his criminal history back, and he had a 35-year-old manslaughter conviction. 
which at that time was having absolutely no consequence on his life. There were some extenuating circumstances, so I had to talk to him about it. But, but you know, that's the kind of thing where something that happened a long time ago uh, you know, shouldn't affect you for the rest of your life. And so you, you want to look at that. What, can the, uh, what has the person's history been since that time? So, um, you know, the uh, uh, housing and urban development, the, the, clear, um, the clear support of the HUD is to give people second chances. And that's really what a large part of the federal government's reentry council and reentry initiative is, is all about. Uh, this is a country of second chances. This is, I mean, we're all immigrants. It's a nation of, of second chances, really. And so uh, their encouragement is from HUD and from the Department of Justice to look closely at the individual tenants and make decisions based on uh, the individual and not have blanket policies. So there are very few and a few federal restrictions uh, that would prevent offenders from living in publicly assisted housing, and that's sex offenders who must register for life, uh, and offenders convicted of manufacturing and possessing methamphetamine in publicly assisted housing, and then there's a three-year ban if evicted from publicly assisted housing for drug-related criminal activity, and finally, committing arson while living in publicly assisted uh, housing, which that, that last one, I think, in particular, uh, seems pretty, pretty reasonable. And then uh, public housing authorities may choose to create a few more restrictions, but they're not imposed by HUD. So there are a few more. And they mostly relate to, I think you'll see um, a couple of things here, violence and drug-type trafficking activity uh, in the area. And even that, I think, is pretty, is pretty restrictive. But I would encourage those of you who are housing uh, providers to look closely at the individual applicant and not have a blanket ban for felons. And, and think about, as you're making those decisions, and, and uh, you know, I understand it's, you know, it's easy for me to say, and all, it's my, job, my office, we put people in prison for long periods of time if they've engaged in conduct that deserves it. So drug traffickers, people who commit violent crimes with guns, uh, people who commit major, major financial frauds, people who commit sex crimes against children. And you know, we send those guys to prison for a long time, but it, it, at some point, those folks are getting out too, and we don't want to have to send them back again. There are a few things I think as a prosecutor more disheartening than when someone has what we call a supervised release violation. They've served their sentence, they're out, and then they do something to end up back in front of the judge because the hope is that they, they you know, learn their lesson and they're able to, to, uh, to go on because it's, uh, it's a much more positive story and a positive outcome if it goes that way. Not everyone is able to do that. But the people who are reentering society need the support of lots of different social forces. And they need the support of housing providers. They need the support of people in the criminal justice system who have put them there. Uh, they need the support of employers. And then they have, a, they have to you know, get it together at some point and do it on their own. Uh, as well. They need, you know, people have substance abuse problems, they need help in, in that area. But as a community, we have a great interest in ha helping those people have success. We have an interest both financially, because as you've seen time and again, it's more expensive to put people in prison than to house them or have them be productive uh, in society. And it's something that will make us, us safer. Uh, homelessness and recidivism are, are closely linked. Uh, in terms of people who have come out of the prison system and can't find a, a place to live, those people are much more likely uh, to reoffend. And if people reoffend, we have more victims, uh, and and our, the community is at risk. So I think those two things, the cost and the safety to our community, should make us all try to work a little bit harder, uh, if not a lot harder, on the project of finding uh, homes and creating affordable housing for those who have paid their debt to society and are reentering. So. Uh, that's my pitch. Yes, sir.
thanks. Well, I'm going um, to summarize real quickly. So the comment was uh, uh, basically there was a concern, particularly in Canyon County, that some individuals uh, are, are being, uh, in my word, is discriminated against or penalized uh, because they associate or are perceived to be associated with individuals who are perceived to be gang members, and then that there may be some uh, housing evictions or other things that would occur with them. And that, I think there would be um, a couple of concerns there. Uh, one is, of course, we need to be careful and judge people on their own individual conduct. I mean, that's, uh, that's sort of the tenet of the, the criminal justice system for sure, but I would encourage people to look, look at their individual applicants and not what they perceive of others. And then I think probably they're also, if, if um, you start judging people on who their associates are, depending on where you are and uh, the color of people's skins, that you start getting into trouble with proxies uh, for a protected status. Yes, ma'am. Well, because it rhymes. It rhymes, right? Yeah, so the question was one of those that came up in that slide. Can the landlord be held liable if they know uh, that one of their tenants has even a 10-year-old burglary felony and then robs the neighbor? And I would, I would say um, unless you, I would say no, unless you know she's going to do it. Any of the other lawyers want to venture a, a different opinion on that one? I mean, I think you have to have specific knowledge that they are at that time uh, going to engage in that activity. Now, when... When poor Melody, who we're picking on here, uh, signs her lease and says, you know, I could use some new stuff, and I see that uh, my other neighbor's got some, a really nice, you know, whatever people have these days, um, I'm going to take it. That may be a different story. Uh, yes? I have a question from the web. Um, is it against the fair housing laws to have applicant criteria where it is, where if an applicant has had a criminal offense within the last three years, is automatically rejected. I would say probably directly that not, but you may get start getting into trouble with with. Do I need to repeat that question since it came from the web? No, because okay. I spoke. Okay, oh, you had the back. All right, um, but it, uh, you know, then you have to start uh, being worried about you know who who whether there's a disproportionate impact and who gets rejected and and who and who doesn't and. It has to be applied pretty pretty evenly, but I think for all of the policy reasons that we have articulated, that that is a um, you know that that is a housing policy that will have uh, potentially unintended consequences for the rest of the community as well as that individual. Yes. Well, I think it depends on how you exercise that judgment. Let's say, okay, here's the question. Um, the question is, if you have that policy and then start making judgment calls, aren't you opening yourself up to, to liability? Well, if you are, it depends on how you exercise that judgment, right? I mean, if you, like, uh, uh, make exceptions for uh, all the white convicted felons and then you continue to exclude all the non-white convicted felons, absolutely. Uh, but if your criteria becomes uh, rather than all felonies, if you go with all violent felonies within the last three years, or all drug trafficking crimes within the last three years, or all um, sex offenses within the last three years, I think that's that's really the difference we're trying to we're trying to get at. Is the criminal conviction one that really threatens the interest that you have as a housing provider? I mean, you want people who are going to be stable tenants, 
uh, who are going to be able to pay uh, the rent on time and who are, are going to be good tenants in the sense that they're going to take care of the place, they're going to be good to the neighbors, uh, whatever else you want them to do that's good in the, in the area. that be a, a violation of the Fair Housing Act? Probably not. Um, is that good public policy? Uh, probably not. Is that good business? I guess that's up to what they've decided. David, do you have any different view on that? Did you hear the question? The question, which I didn't, uh, uh, the question was, what about a policy that is geared to things like disturbing the peace, or even if it's a misdemeanor, or property damage? Would that be a violation of the Fair Housing Act? I suspect it's a violation, probably not. I, well, whenever, whenever you're ready for me to be done, I can be done. <laughs> are there any other are there any other questions? All right. If you if you have questions like that, let me just tell you. Uh, I'm going to go over 30 seconds. You have two excellent resources who are here this afternoon: David Penny and uh, Zoanne Olson, both of whom know way more about the specifics of uh, fair housing law than probably uh, anyone else in the room, unless maybe Mr. Block is still here. But they're excellent resources, so you can certainly pose uh, any follow-up questions you have to them, and they'll probably better remember the uh, repeat the question rule. All right, thank you. Okay, guys, we're going to head on into the next section. Um, it's fair housing compliance from a housing provider attorney's perspective. Many of you that have been to these before are familiar with David Penny. Um, and so here he is. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is fair housing from the landlord's perspective which is also the attorney's perspective, if you're me, because I've been doing this for uh, uh, going on 29 years. Um, so I've got some familiarity with the uh, Fair Housing Act and, you know, got plenty of war stories, but uh, you all have your own, certainly if you're in the industry. So we'll talk about yours instead of talking about mine. Um, uh, my office is in the same building complex as uh, Wendy Old.